Okay, uh, members, Tashinam doing ya, Keshni Funya, Ira Rin and Fubble. It's now time for questions to the Minister for Communities. And just before we go to the first question, I'd like to advise members that questions two and three have been withdrawn. So, first question I call Mr. William Humphrey. Your question number one. Mr. Thanks very much. Just, um, I've now agreed my final budget allocations within my department, and as I've previously committed to, I have protected the budget for these vital services. There's no reduction in the budget for advice services, including for appeals and tribunal representation, as the department allocates funding for these services through local government. Belfast City Council is responsible for deciding how it allocates funding for the appeals service, including the Belfast City Wide Tribunal Service. I am investing around £6.4 million this year in a wide range of advice, appeals and debt services, and there are no additional monies over and above this amount that could be used to match any increase in funding by the Belfast City Council at this time. Okay, Dorlinta, okay, or sorry, um, Mr. William Humphrey for a supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Minister, I understand that Belfast City Council has agreed to provide £75,000 for this year and then £55,000 £55, for the following year, subject to due diligence. Can the Minister commit to, in this House, because our answer falls short of that, to supporting in, in kind exactly what Belfast City Council want to do in terms of monetary? Well, we've made the allocation I've made in terms of maintaining the budget that was previously there. That then goes to Belfast City Council in terms of then how that money is used for its ring fenced for advice and representation. Um, so I've had no further requests in, but as I said, the budget that we have is the budget that we've got. Um, there's nothing additional there at this point. But of course, if there's a, I suppose a request made, I'm happy to look at the issues, but it is that we're working within a constrained budget and effect a cut. Um, within the department, but I am glad that we were able to protect this vital funding at this point going forward. Can the, the Minister give an assurance that funding will continue uh, to support the important work of tribunal representations? Well, I have given a commitment, um, as was previously seen in the draft budget consultation, the full equality impact assessment that I put out. Money wasn't secured um, in terms of the overarching budget, but I have secured it within my own internal budgets um, going forward. I see the vital role of the advice sector, um, not just during the pandemic, but before that as well, and previously as a councillor, for example, in Belfast City Council. So I want to continue to do all that I can to support them and work with them in the time ahead. Keshtig, Matthew Toole. Question from Matthew Toole. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister, you'll be aware that last week the President of the Appeals Tribunal, uh, John Duffy, published his report on standards of decision-making by the Department of Communities in 1718. In it, he talks about, quote, the systemic problem with healthcare professional assessments, uh, particularly relating to PIP uh, and ESA assessments. Can I ask what the Minister is doing in terms of the representations of John Duffy to, simplima- to simplify that process, including whether she and her department are finally considering uh, requiring via legislation that a short GP summary re- report uh, be uh, provided ahead of uh, initial decisions are being made? Well, I think yes. I mean, I'm looking at the report. Um, we're obviously going to be providing a response, and I know that that was taken from the start of the PIP process. There's obviously been changes that have been made since then until now, and there will be continue to be changes in that process to make sure that it's working as best as it can for those claimants. And we obviously, going forward, want to announce plans that we want to engage uh, with those who are claiming the benefits. Um, in a more structured way, to listen to their views, to make sure that we continue uh, to make changes in the time ahead, and that's something um, that I'm committing to do. Um, obviously, we'll be looking at uh, PIP more fundamentally as well, in terms of making sure that it is responding um, to the needs of people out on the ground. There are some issues pertaining to parity, obviously, with Westminster, and there are ongoing discussions with DWP. I know there's a green paper, for example. Um, that is being looked at um, in in Westminster as well, and we're waiting on the outcomes of that coming forward also. So in the time ahead, I will be making more announcements around this area. I called Kelly Armstrong. 
Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, thank you very much for your question so far. I know you, you are committed to the advice um, sector. In 2016, the Deloitte report confirmed that a new funding model was needed for the Belfast Citywide Tribunal Service. Can the Minister confirm what actions she has taken to move those recommendations forward to ensure that there is not a postcode lottery across Northern Ireland and um, to ensure that, that any of those recommendations will be aligned across all council areas? Yeah, well, obviously, we work closely with Belfast City Council um, in terms of that work is going forward. Uh, we secure the money in terms of the advice services, and indeed, I'm glad that we were able to do that this time around. Uh, we have continued discussions, and indeed, even with the advice sector themselves, and that's something that we're going to be looking at in the time ahead um, to see what additional or what changes we can make to make sure advice services are. Um, available to people right across the board and across all communities and to look at any particular barriers that may be there to remove those. So we will be continuing to have those discussions with Belfast City Council, but importantly with the advice sector themselves. Question, Jerry Carroll. Uh, Jerry Carroll for a question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is very disappointing to hear that the Department does not provide much funding for this vital service, which has provided support for tens of thousands of people, including my own constituents. And many will be asking. Uh, why things have gotten this uh, way this far, and why wasn't the funding included in the budget after implementing the welfare reform? Why did it take Belfast City Council to match fund half of it, and why can't the department fully fund it for next year? I ask the minister what message does this uh, send to advice workers uh, in city wide and also across the north that she hasn't uh, done this? Well, I think firstly I've worked very well with the independent advice sector over the last year, and particularly um, through the COVID pandemic. I have engaged that sector um, also, as have my officials. And we have actually invested over six point four million per annum into budgets for independent advice because we recognise the importance of that. I do encourage as well councils who obviously look at this issue, and I was in Belfast City Council um, when funding was put into the advice sector as well. The budget is what it is. It is not a good budget that was given, but the, the, the issue is, is that that was given in a block grant. There was effectively a cut by the British government in terms of the budget here. I have raised concerns about that. I raised that any time I meet a minister. I met with a minister from the NIO last Thursday, and again I raised the issues of the budget, that when they give a flat budget in real terms that means a cut. Um, I also raised the issue that uh, commitments in New Decade, New Approach, in terms of financing still haven't been lived up to and that they need to be coming forward urgently um, in terms of addressing those shortcomings. So I won't be found wanting. That said, in the absence of a budget being allocated, I have actually protected uh, the money going into the advice sector and I will continue to do that in the time ahead. I call Harry Harvey. Very much, Deputy Speaker. I'll be question four, Minister, please. Thanks very much um, for your question and indeed for the email that just gave more information um, in the Arts Football Club as well. And just am pleased to see the renewed engagement between Arts Football Club and Arts and North Down Borough Council in their vision for a new stadium, which would once again give the club a permanent home in the Newton Arts community. Unfortunately, in terms of funding to develop club facilities, I can confirm that there are currently no capital grant programmes within my department or Sport NI, uh, which Arts Football Club can apply. My advisors have advised the club to register with Sport NI to receive information on future potential funding programmes that may assist them in realising the ambition to develop their new stadium. Arts Football Club may benefit from future potential funding through the sub-regional stadia programme, which was obviously set out in New Decade New Approach. And I have asked officials to undertake a review of the programme to satisfy myself the proposals are meeting uh, not just the current needs but the future needs as well. This refresh and re-engagement review exercise is nearing completion, and the evidence collected through uh, club surveys, strategic one-to-one -one discussions with key stakeholders, and collaboration with the advisory working group have informed the shape and scope of the programme going forward. I intend to update executive colleagues in the coming weeks on the future implementation of the programme, identifying the potential timelines for delivery and the levels of support available to clubs across the north. Mr Harvey, for a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank you very much, Minister, for your answers thus far. As you know, I have been trying to strike up conversation with yourself on this proposal. And I would like to ask that you would meet with myself and the manager at the proposed site to look 
and listen to the vision and respond with your thoughts on the way forward. Thank you. Yes, always happy to accept invitations from members. I call Mike Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, thank you. I thank the Minister for, for her answers. Can she just clarify then, is she saying that there is no budget for the sub-regional uh, uh, stadia in the current financial year? And if that is the case, when does she expect that money to be freed up? No, there is a budget there and a commitment there, £36.6 million for the sub-regional stadia. Um, the exercise that was taking place was to make sure that the initial outcomes of that programme still meet the needs today and there was a refreshment and a re-engagement with sports organisations and a survey. My officials are now tidying up and making a proposal to me on the way forward in terms of that money being spent. Um, and I want to um, present that to the executive within the coming weeks in order then to get the programme up and running. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, I just um, thank you very much for your answers so far. I'll declare an interest because I, I pay sponsorship money into Arts Football Club for their programmes. Um, Minister, I am disappointed um, by your answers so far, but I understand the predicament that we are in. Arts Football um, Club hasn't had a home for quite some time. I was wondering if, you, as you said there, um, the sub-regional stadium money may not actually be money that ARDS could apply for because they have no home at the moment. So I'm wondering, has there been any discussions with the Strategic Investment Board for such capital expenditure for clubs to be able to apply to? Well, at the, currently there's no other capital programme, um, and I mean this is across a number of sporting organisations have engaged heavily with sports over the last couple of months. Obviously, they've been impacted by the pandemic, and they also have played a huge role um, in terms of the pandemic, and no doubt in terms of the recovery. And obviously, I mean, all members here have raised questions, both orally and written, um, over the last year on the importance of sports more generally, and I completely recognise that. The money that we have got at the moment is for the sub-regional stadia. I also recognise and have said previously that that may not be enough in terms of the demand. You're most certainly it won't be enough. And obviously, I will have to keep discussions ongoing with the executive. It will be dependent on the budget and what's available and measured against other pressures in health and education uh, more broadly. But if there is a need for an increase um, in terms of capital, I will obviously be making those representations and requests to the executive. Um, I haven't had a direct engagement with the Strategic Investment Board, but certainly it's something that I could do, and I would be keen at some point to look at a small capital programme for sports organisations as well, and recognising that not all would fit in um, to the sub-regional stadia, and there's a lot of work that goes on, particularly at the grassroots. Again, we have no budget for that, but I would be keen again to engage with the executive to see if we can find a budget to bring forward programmes because there's no doubt there's a huge need and demand out there within the community, and that's something that I want to continue to engage on. I call Paul Frey. Speaker, question number five to the Minister. My department does not hold uh, record information based on constituency. However, the details of the number of personal independence payment appeals pending per town in North Antrim as of the 31st of March this year um, are as follows. Ballymena 310, Ballymoney 98, making a total of 408 people in the North Antrim area who are waiting on an appeal hearing. Mr. Frew, supplementary. Thank you, the Minister, for your answer uh, to my question. And again, uh, to get some sort of comparison with regards to those figures, can you supply uh, numbers for previous years in order that we can get some sort of context to those figures? I don't have those at hand now, but I can write to you formally, um, Paul, just with an update on previous years. Adam, sir, Liz Kimmins, point your cash to call Liz Kimmins. I thank the Minister for answer so far. Minister, as you'll be aware, the importance of ensuring that those going through the appeals process um, are not suffering financially. Can you therefore outline what steps you're taking um, to ensure that this is not the case? Thank you. Yeah, obviously, uh, mitigation uh, payments are continuing for those appealants who are awaiting the outcome of the appeal. Um, and where the initial claim was for disability living allowance or those transitioning um, to PIP as well. 
uh, my department obviously has advised appealants who are experiencing financial hardship to make contact with their local office as soon as possible, and then also obviously to engage with the independent advice sector as well. Obviously, we want to address the backlog in hearings, and obviously part of that uh, was because of the uh, coronavirus um, and because we had to suspend face-to-face -face hearings. We have been transitioning and obviously rolling out a number of pilots in terms of telephone assessments and also looking at uh, doing it virtually. Again, though, it has to be down to what the claimant wants, and we still know that the majority of those prefer face-to-face -face assessments. So obviously we're working with the appeal service in terms of trying to deny as easements are coming in around regulations, how we can start then to safely reopen face-to-face -face and to deal with the backlog as soon as possible. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. The figure from Bellamina of 310 is particularly disappointing. Though it doesn't surprise me that my office has an appeal next week, which has been waiting for 14 months. Uh, I would like to know, could the Minister supply the average waiting time in North Antrim for an appeal? Because certainly it seems to be something that needs taken under control, and the return of face-to-face -face would be a major step forward. I don't have the exact waiting time, but I can furnish you with that um, in a written response. Um, I do know the caseload, obviously, from the 31st of March this year was 8,639, and as of the same period, 6,067 uh, live PIP appeals are in the system, which makes 71 per cent of the overall caseload. As I said, a big part of that was obviously because appeals completely shut down during the pandemic. Um, which started in March of last year. I know the appeal service extended that um, at the start of this year with the new restrictions that had come in over Christmas. And there's no doubt that that has led to unacceptable levels in terms of appeals. Officials are now working with the service um, and working with the advice sector as well to look at how we have a safe reopening, how we can increase the capacity around trying to deal with those as soon as possible. And have also been rolling out a number of pilots, as I've said, around telephone assessments and also to do it virtually. But again, recognising that the majority of people still prefer face to face, and if that's what they prefer, we have to deal with that as well. So I am hopeful with the easing of more restrictions, with these pilots, with obviously jobs and benefit offices and others beginning to open again um, with the easing, um, that we can start to deal uh, with this and get people. Uh, through the process as quickly as possible, but I'll furnish you with the specifics of your question in a written response. Here, Mr. Mark Durkin, for your cash, I call Mark Durkin. I uh, ask Sean Cullion to thank the Minister for her answers thus far. The number of appeals, and more so the number of successful appeals, is clear evidence, in my view, that the system isn't working. Uh, many parties, including the Minister's own, have been correctly, in my view, scathing about Capita's uh, performance. Can the Minister inform the House if she will be extending Capita's contract, how that might look and how much it might cost? Well, those issues are currently being looked at at the moment. I recognise um, the issues that have been around the assessments. I recognise public opinion around some of these issues as well. Um, but in terms of moving, I have also indicated that my policy position would be to move towards an in-house model um, and what that would look like. I mean, previously, the in-house model was working with local GPs. Again, there were difficulties that were presented there. We are also looking at the Scottish model, where they work with health trusts. And again, we have had engagements with the health minister. But again, there has to be changes that are made there. For example, the system in which people are recorded are done differently depending on which health trust. There is no one database the way there may be in England. And we found this issue around the food distribution service when there was not that single database. And I know that that is going to take a bit of time for health to put that in place. Um, but I am keen um, that a policy is taken that we transition and move to an in-house service. Again, we are trying to work out the timelines of that at the moment. Once I have made a, a decision around that and on what those timescales will look like, I will certainly update the House and the Committee in the time ahead. I call Rachel Woods for her question. Question number six. Thank you. So it's just people who remain in receipt of legacy benefits and credits will be moved on to universal credit in the next phase of the rollout known as Move to UC. 
Prior to the COVID-19, uh, my department notified stakeholders here that the planned commencement date for move to UC uh, would not be before January 2021, with an estimated completion date of September 2024. Planning the move to UC was temporarily paused to allow my department to focus all available resources on responding to the COVID pandemic. And as you will know, universal credit figures more than doubled here um, in terms of those who needed it. And again, we had to respond to make sure that people were paid. A start date for the commencement of move to UC here has not been confirmed. And I have asked my officials for an assessment of the optimal timing for the move to UC process to recommence here, and will bring forward proposals for doing so at the earliest possible opportunity. Stakeholders will also be updated when plans are more certain. Rachel Woods for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers so far. The Minister will be aware that the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions recently announced that the process for moving legacy benefit claimants onto universal credit would be completed by 2024. So could the Minister confirm us if this is the timeline that her department would be working to in the coming months, and also if she'll be engaging further with the independent advice sector, um, as they will be able, enable them to support uh, the claimants who will need help transferring to uh, or not to universal credit in the coming years? Well, um, obviously, I mean, as I just said, there's obviously there was a pause in the move, and that may disrupt the timetable in terms of that final date. Um, I know, obviously, my officials are working closely with the Department of Work and Pensions in Britain in terms of that time scale. That's why I've asked for an assessment um, in terms of recommencing this process and then how long that will take. And that will be for ministerial approval going forward. So once I have that assessment, I will then make a decision in terms of when that's likely that we can commence that work. And of course, that will be done um, engaging stakeholders, uh, looking at the implications. Because obviously, I mean, this is going to be a huge change um, for thousands and thousands of people. And obviously, having that independent advice for people as they're transitioning through will be key in making sure the capacity is there. So we'll be doing that with engagement with the sector. And then I'll make my decision after that and again notify the House. Minister, can you give assurance to my constituents in Derry and to others across the North that those that are being transferred from legacy benefits to universal credit will have a transitional protection? And what would that transitional protection be? In terms of we're looking at these issues um, at the moment by way of transitional protections as well, um, in terms of moving over, some people indeed will be financially better off uh, with a move to universal credit, and obviously we want to work with those in the time ahead in terms of looking at the implications as part of that transitional period. So we're continuing to look at that at the moment. It's part of the transitional assessment that I've asked officials to look at. Uh, once I have that assessment back, then I will come back and update the House. And I can also sorry, correspond with you directly as well. Uh, the member isn't in their place for the next question, so I call uh, Christopher Stolford. Question number eight, sir. <coughs> Yet through the regional stadia programme, my department has grant funded the three sporting codes to deliver their respective stadia. Community engagement is an important element of the delivery. In anticipation of planning approval for Ulster GAA, um, is finalising details proposals for a fresh engagement within the community. The GAA is clear on the importance of being a good neighbour to the community around Casement Park and more broadly. And I have regular engagement with the Ulster Council GAA project team who are involved in the stadia development in relation to the fundamental element of this project. Mr. Stolford for a supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I congratulate the I had no anticipation of being called in question number eight, so I congratulate the Minister on her brevity in getting this far down the list. Um, having said that, the Minister has failed to answer my question. I asked her which, what engagement she or her department has had with local residents around the area uh, in relation to this development proposal, and does she agree with me that it is important that the views of local residents are taken on board in relation to this matter? Thank you. Well, in terms of the engagement, the project overall is owned by Ulster Council GAA, and obviously I have been encouraging the GAA to have engagements. That said, there's the plan and approval hasn't been complete yet, and obviously we need to watch in terms of the type of engagement until we know that the plan and approval has been granted in full. 
I have been engaging with the GAA um, in terms of the programme board um, that have been established to look at the redevelopment of Casement Park. And obviously, my background just in community development, I have said that they need to be engaging proactively. I know they have an engagement strategy there um, that once planning has been approved. I have had no direct engagement personally um, with the residents group there, either those who are opposed to it or those who are in support of it as well. Obviously, I am waiting on planning permission um, to be approved because I do not want to do anything um, that, would be, that would have an impact on that consideration um, going forward. But there will be, and I have been pushing the GAA to have a comprehensive engagement and also working with Belfast City Council and the Department to look at the wider issues, but also the opportunities um, that this redevelopment can bring. As you will know within your own constituency, um, what the development of Windsor has done for the community there. From um, could I ask the Minister for her assessment on the, some of the benefits that, um, in her opinion, the Casement Park development will bring to the wider community of West Belfast, but also more broadly um, to the Gaelic Games and culture? Thank you. Well, I think, firstly, if you go up to Casement Park, I mean, the state that it's in at the moment, and I know certainly Antrim Gales and somebody who's been a camogie player in the past. There is a huge aspiration and demand to see Casement Park revitalised and redeveloped. Obviously, the construction jobs um, as an immediate um, impact is something there in terms of the scale um, of this infrastructure. It is actually one of the biggest infrastructure projects that this executive would take forward in this mandate um, once the approval is signed off and going forward in terms of the direct jobs that would benefit from it. The redevelopment of the whole wider Anderson's town area. Um, I mean, when you look at the Falls Road from the bottom right up, there have been huge developments over the last 10 years in the west of the city, um, and indeed this will be one of the signature projects um, when you just look at the, the frontage of that road. Obviously, as part of the wider community impact, and this is where I've been working with the GAA, that we want to see a wider impact, just not for Gales, I mean, in terms of playing in a stadium but also for the community as well and how this pitch can be used, how the facilities can be used um, by other sports organisations, but indeed by the wider community as well. So there will be huge economic benefits, but also social, cultural and sporting benefits as well for the community. We have seen that uh, with the other two stadia that have been developed in terms of the partnering that they have done in terms of the outwork that they have done with local sports organisations and growing their own sport particularly around women, those with disabilities as well. Um, and I am hopeful that the redevelopment of Casement Park will also bring good opportunities, um, just as it was done at the other two stadia. Matthew Tulf, on your case. Matthew Tulf. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, Casement will be a huge benefit, not just for, uh, for Ulster Gales, for Antrim, GAA. It's, it's hugely overdue and welcome when hopefully it gets built. But the potential could go much wider than that. It could be global. Uh, there is at the minute plans for a joint British-Irish World Cup bid for 2030. The truth is that Casement Park will probably be the only stadium in Northern Ireland that would be capable of hosting World Cup games. Minister, what representations are you making with the IFA, the FAI, the FA in London in order to place Casement Park at the centre of that potential World Cup bid and potentially bring World Cup football to Belfast? Yeah, I think, I mean, thank you for your question. And you're right, it would be the stadium that would actually really advance in terms of that competition. Obviously, the Minister of the Economy takes the lead on the engagement that's happening with London. Um, but in my capacity as Sports Minister, um, we have been engaging proactively with our officials and also in engaging with the Minister in terms of uh, saying what the potential of uh, facilities such as Casement can do as part of that bid. So we'll continue to keep that engagement going. Um, but primarily it is the Minister of Economy that represents the executive with regards to um, the I suppose the making the application for the games. Uh, sir, Justin McNulty. I call Justin McNulty and we'll probably just have time for the Minister's answer on this one without the supplementary. Thank you. Yep, you are aware that the sub-regional stadia programme for soccer is a priority, a new decade, new approach, and consistently confirmed my commitment. The programme does provide a real opportunity to 
deliver um, a wider range of government priorities to address social, economic and cultural needs. And I've asked my officials to undertake a review of the programme to satisfy me that the proposals just don't look at the current needs, but also the future needs as well. As I've said in response to oral question four, the refresh and re-engagement exercise is nearing completion. Um, I'm hoping to have that uh, presented then to me, and then in the coming weeks I want to make a presentation to the executive for saying off and for that programme to go forward. Additionally, department officials have also worked with experts in an advisory group comprising of key stakeholders from Chief uh, Leisure Officers Association, the IFA, the NIFL, Sport NI, and indeed my department as well. And this has ensured a collaborative approach to developing the shape and the scope of the programme going forward. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr. Alan Chambers. Uh, can I ask the uh, Minister for a timeline for when she will create a fund to encourage the creation of changing places, which are state-of-the-art facilities for those with severe disabilities in buildings uh, across Northern Ireland? Yes, yeah, so just in 2018-19, my department um, has been working in partnership with the Department of Agriculture and Rural Affairs and local councils, and also with the PHA, to look at the access um, around changing facilities. A total of 12 new changing uh, place facilities have been supported through this programme at a range of locations across the north. My department is leading on the development of the executive's disability strategy, and obviously, as part of this strategy, we have developed a co-design approach with the sector. Uh, the issue of change in places provisions have been included. Obviously, we are working with the Department of Finance to consider how these issues are reflected in the new strategy and the funding that would be made available for them. And subject to that, I will be presenting the consultation, or sorry, the full disability strategy after consultation to the executive in December of this year. Mr Chambers for a supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for her answer. And, uh, uh, England has created a similar fund with £30 million. Can the Minister commit to a proportionate level of funding in Northern Ireland? Well, there's ongoing discussions at the moment um, in terms of finance and looking at what that uh, would mean in the time ahead. Once that's been confirmed, then I will update members uh, going forward. Gary Middleton for a question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware the recent figures have highlighted that 400,000 people across Northern Ireland are living in po poverty. 27% uh, of those are within the council area in my constituency in London area in Strabane. Uh, what is the Minister going to do or, or what is the Minister going to do differently to try and tackle these shocking figures? Well, I think the figures around poverty are well known. I think everybody has seen that they have been exacerbated and highlighted as a result of the pandemic. Obviously, I had responsibility in terms of bringing forward an anti-poverty strategy, which also includes children's poverty um, as part of New Decade New Approach. We established an expert panel. Their report was published in uh, March of this year. Um, and now we have established a co-design group working with community organisations, experts involved in this field, both in children's poverty and also poverty more broadly. We have also established a cross-departmental working group because it's recognising poverty just doesn't rest within my department. It spans rights across. And even in I know the Health Committee last week, there was a report looking at health inequalities um, and where those numbers have actually got worse rather than better. Um, so, again, we're working across government to look at what comes out of the co-design approach, um, how that's going to be funded, how departments can take a lead on certain aspects of that. That will then go for public consultation. Um, and then I'm hoping the timeline is for me to present this strategy along with the other inclusion strategies for sign off and approval in December of this year. There's obviously also ongoing work, um, and I've also got obviously papers in around welfare mitigations and, and looking at other protections as well, and indeed the whole housing transformation that we are trying to do, recognising that housing plays a fundamental role, and again, looking at areas like FOIL, uh, where there are high levels um, of those in housing need, I want to introduce ring fencing that starts to address the housing crisis in the likes of FOIL in North and West Belfast and in other areas as well. Supplementary for Gary Middleton. 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her uh, response to that question. The Minister will also be aware that there are particular challenges often within our rural communities, and it's something that I have heard time and time again about the, the, the difference in terms of some of the more urban communities and the funding available for rural communities. So would the Minister commit to looking at addressing and putting a focus on how we bring uh, our rural communities up to par with many of our urban uh, villages as well? Yeah, no, I think it's a, an important point, and all that I'm looking to do bringing forward is making sure that we are rural proofing our policies and our spend as well. Um, and that will ultimately mean, obviously, a change in spend or how money is allocated, for example, through councils and other mechanisms as well. But I am committed um, to looking at all of these issues. I've also wrote in terms of regeneration functions, I mean, primarily mine is within the department as a focus on urban settings. Um, and I know that many members have uh, written to me even recently in terms of looking at rural settings as well. I have engaged with uh, the DERA Minister and also infrastructure around trying to get a joined up approach, looking at rural um, issues and uh, I suppose rural inequality. Um, they have been positive. I know we did do some funding during the pandemic to respond to the needs of the rural community. Um, and it's something that we're going to be bringing forward soon. So I've asked for a meeting with them. We're doing an assessment in terms of that rural proofing, and hopefully we can bring forward an announcement between the three ministries in terms of making a change in those areas. And of course, as part of the housing programme, again, looking at specific rural needs. Um, we have obviously met with um, community organisations as well in rural areas, again, where these issues have been consistently raised. So, in working with the other ministries, we want to bring forward then proposals as to what we're going to change um, in terms of addressing the issues. Question for Melissa McHugh. Last one, Carla. Ira, could you set out for us uh, your commitment to and plans uh, to increase social housing? Yeah, well, obviously, I mean, I know this has been raised on a regular basis. There was the statement by Carl Nicollin when she was in this position last November, which set out a trajectory of what we need to do um, around housing in the time ahead. And obviously, there are huge changes around revitalising the housing executive, ensuring that it deals with its historic debt issues, looking at the seven billion deficit that it needs just to maintain its current stock, and also allowing it to build again. Um, freeing it up. So obviously there's been we have established a programme board with the Housing Executive and Strategic Investment Board around looking at what those models and options look like. Obviously I want to try and do that, retaining the current setup of the Housing Executive, and that's something that we're looking at at the moment. We have had a good result on the corporation tax, where the Housing Executive over the last six years was playing over £56 million in corporation tax. We have now been exempt from that and we are trying to claw some of that money back whilst also dealing with the historic debt. And then we are also looking at, we are going to be going out to consult soon on a housing supply strategy, so looking at the supply going forward um, in the time ahead, looking at issues around right to buy, around ring fencing, um, and then also looking at um, an exercise to identify surplus land, and again working with local councils around them, identifying public land within their council areas to address the issue of housing. And we also want to work, uh, we're starting to work with the housing executive around looking at towns and city centres above the shops. Are there other things that we can be doing? And even to um, buy back some homes um, as well, to introduce them again into the public housing market. And this year going forward, I mean, I'm glad we've seen an increase in the housing budget by £26 million. So this year's budget is £162 million. Also, within the 2020-2021 period, uh, we had an increase, uh, the first of its kind in a decade, in new social homes started. So we had 2,403 homes, um, and that's something that I want to look at in the time ahead to make sure that we can build the capacity and also to have the finance to look at an increased um, housing development uh, over the next period. Okay, Melissa McHugh, supplementary from Melissa McHugh. Okay. Good uh, I uh, thank you, Minister, for your statement, and you're to be congratulated, as is your department as well, too, for uh, the uh, objectives that have been achieved to date uh, in terms of the completion of new social housing and the very fact that you have exceeded uh, targets in both the commencement and the completion. Can I also ask you, Minister, then, that what steps? Uh, are you taking in order to ensure this trajectory uh, continues in the future? 
Well, as I say, we have set up programme boards in terms of bringing forward uh, proposed models on the way forward to deal with some of the historic debt issues, some of the finances around the housing executive as well. All of this work um, will culminate in the time ahead in a proposal with time scales and with finance attached that I will be presenting to the executive before the end of this mandate for sign off and approval. I'm also, as I said, moving on um, engagements and on consultations around a supply strategy um, for the North as well. And I'm looking to introduce things such as ring fencing, which will be done within this mandate. Um, but the longer term challenges will be presented in a comprehensive report to the executive before the end of this mandate. And work is well underway um, around developing that. As the member is in his, is in his place for question number four, uh, Buggy Mishere will move on. I guess uh, Adam, Sir, or Leah Flynn for any cash. I call or Leah Flynn for a question. Minister, can I ask what your plans are, if any, to legislate to ensure the people and families who are living in the private rented sector um, will have a safe and secure home? Yes, I will be bringing forward. I have a proposal currently with the executive for the first strand of legislation to build in extra protections for those living in the private rented sector. And obviously, when you're looking at the revitalisation of housing and what needs to be done, I mean, there's more children and families now living in the private rented sector than in the social sector, and it's a huge area in terms of the conditions, in terms of the safety standards um, of those people. So part of the legislation will look at the health and safety within a home, look at electrical checks, carbon monoxide alarms being inserted in. We're also drafting um, other legislation within the private rented sector to deal with issues such as letting agents and having a longer term review, but there's consultations and engagements that need to happen um, around those other areas of work, and particularly around the rules of councils and enhancing their rules around enforcement um, issues as well. So the first part of that legislation, I'm hoping, will be signed off soon um, by the executive in terms of bringing forward um, a bill, and then we will be drafting and working on a supplementary piece of legislation before the end of this mandate as well. Supplementary question for Minister, you partly answered um, my, my supplementary question there. It was just around, well, first and foremost, delighted to hear that that legislation is being prepared for and is going to be progressed because we know the amount of families that are living in substandard housing accommodation and it's not fair, it's not right. Um, but can you maybe elaborate a wee bit more on the detail of the timeline of how that legislation um, will, will progress? So maybe just some more around maybe dates. Yeah, well, the first part of the legislation I wanted to be completed by the end of this mandate, so obviously engaging with the Communities Committee. I've highlighted um, a number of pieces of legislation that I want to bring forward by the end of this mandate. So it will go through the normal process of introducing legislation, go to the Committee for consideration. Um, and so I would be hopeful by the end of this mandate we will have that legislation in. So that's the timeline that I'm working to in order to bring those protections in for the residents, as you say, living in the private sector. Mayor, Liz Kimmins, for your cash, I call Liz Kimmins. Thank the Minister for answer so far. Minister, can you detail how organisations such as charities, voluntary groups and sports clubs will benefit from the legislation changes um, regarding lotteries? Yeah, well, I was glad to bring forward this change in legislation to allow those organisations to sell uh, lottery tickets online for fundraising activities. This primarily came from a, a request from NICFA and from the sector themselves, who asked us to look at this and the impact, obviously, that the pandemic has had on the ability of charities and others to fundraise and to look at more flexibilities um, that can be built in. So I'm delighted that we've been able to make this change um, and that from here on in, those organisations then can fundraise through ticketing and through lottery schemes um, going forward. So it lifts the block and it's something that the sector wanted. Thank you, Mr. Linta. and and thank the Minister for answering it. I think it's important to welcome the Minister's commitment in addressing this issue as it does open um, vital funding streams for for many organisations, particularly as we come out of the, the current pandemic. Um, can you therefore provide an update on any other supports available um, to help community, cultural and sporting organisations through this pandemic? Yeah, well, overall, the department's invested over £306 million, um, as part of the COVID monies over the last year. 
A large part of that was going into food support, was going into the community support programme that runs through councils, and we've been working collaboratively with councils, who then ultimately work with community organisations at the grassroots. I stood up a community's um, emergencies leadership group involving grassroots organisations and also strategic organisations that have helped us craft our response to the COVID pandemic and also to look at the recovery. I met with that group just over two weeks ago in terms of looking at the social recovery going forward. And obviously, we're bidding at the moment in terms of COVID monies uh, going forward in terms of looking at um, the restrictions being eased. So obviously, I want to continue to try and support the sports sector um, the charity sector, the community development organisations as well, and also our culture, arts and heritage sector going forward. So I have been making bids to do with the COVID money to try and look at that in the time ahead. And one of the areas that we have secured in the budget um, was the £9 million in terms of homeless services as well, particularly as restrictions begin to ease. That may actually um, bring issues to light, um, such as homelessness, and obviously we want to make sure that we're working with the sector and that we have the resources in place to do that. So I'm going to continue to engage uh, moving forward. Okay, members, time is up for topical questions. If you just take your ease while we change to the next item of business. Thank you.